you all this morning at Small Point Baptist Church. We are glad that you are here. If you're joining us online, we are glad you are joining us as well. We're excited about today, and not just because it's my birthday. So there we get that out there at the front, okay? Uh, but also, yesterday, Riley had a birthday, so there's two of us to sing to, all right? So we're going to sing happy birthday to Riley, and then if you want to sing to me, go ahead. So, all right, but we're sing I'm singing to Riley, all right? this morning. I uh, just want to remind all of you that are in the Experiencing God Bible Study, we are meeting today at 4 o'clock to continue, and uh, I think this is kind of a pivotal lesson, talking about faith today. Um, so be here at 4 o'clock. Uh, uh, also, I want to remind all of you seniors, helping seniors, we restarted last week, and there may have been a small number, but we had a good time, didn't we, Gene? We had some great conversation, encouragement, and a time of prayer together, so... Uh, if, if you are looking for just a time to gather here at the church Tuesday from 10 to 12, come on out. We have a time of fellowship, get to know one another, uh, offer opportunity. You know, maybe we'll have goodies, you know, snack together. But, you know, if you want to learn something, uh, I am going to be offering a free internet slash computer training course for all of you that would like to learn a little bit more about the computer, how to navigate, get on starting the beginning of May. So on Tuesday morning, and, uh, we will do that. We'll offer other things, but it's a great time. So if uh, you are a senior, we would love for you to come out and join us at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. So um, also, if you're interested in BBS, I think Rachel's still looking for anybody who would like to be a part of that. In fact, quite a few sign up. That's great. Um, uh, Mary, so, specifically, if anyone wants to help plan how we're going to make it work in light of COVID. All right. If anyone wants to help be part of the planning team, to make it work with COVID. So uh, please sign up with Rachel so we can start discussing that and putting those things in place. Also, two weeks from today, April 25th, after service, we will have our uh, spring family meeting. If you're not a member of the church, you're more than welcome to stay for the family meeting. It's just kind of going over business for the church as well as kind of planning out BBS, several things, and we'd like everyone to stay and be a part of that. I'm gonna encourage you all to bring your own lunch. Okay, we're not going to do potluck or anything. We bring your own lunch. We'll spread out and get everybody spread out so you can eat while we have the meeting and be safe. So, all right. Those are those are the only announcements that I have. Uh, you know, uh, so our call to worship is from Psalm 105 this morning. The first a couple of verses here. The psalmist writes, "Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim His name. Make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him. Sing praise to Him. Tell of all of His wonderful acts." Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord at his strength to seek his face always. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to stand right now and we're going to sing and begin by praising him. Glory to his name.
very short scripture reading this morning, as we're only going to be tackling three verses today. 1 Timothy 3, 14 to 16 says, Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions so that, if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery for which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. May God add the blessing of his reading of his word. You may be seated. All right, time for our Kids' Corner. And we only have Mr. Riley today, but he wants to come hang out with me, so we're going to have some fun. You know what we're going to talk about today? Family. Do you like your family? Yeah, what do you like about your family? Sisters. Because they love me. Because they love me. Oh, so, family, why don't you love your grandma and grandpa? Yeah. Your grandparents? Why do you love them? Because they love me to have sleepovers. They you have sleepovers. Oh, I like sleepovers at my grandparents' house too. That's really cool. Alright? So, family is really cool, aren't they? Do you have cousins? Do you love your cousins? Yes. Do they love you? Yes. yes. Oh, man, why? Huh? Do you like to get together with your family? Yes. Why does family get together? Uh, I'm trying to spend time together. I'm trying to spend time together because we love each other, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Look at all these lovely faces up here. Come on. Come on right there. Let's look over here. Look way over here. Look at all those faces. Do you know that you're, they're, your, they're your family, too? How are they your family? So, as God's family, we're supposed to act certainly, right? Showing love to one another, but do we always act that way? No, sometimes. You ever get it? You fight. Oh, man. Do you fight with your sisters ever? Sometimes, oh uh, man, you fight with your parents sometimes? You argue sometimes. You argue sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Most of the time when we argue, fight because we're not getting something we want, right? We're being selfish, right? Yeah, the same thing can happen in the family. In this big family here, all the different people, we're going to fight sometimes. But does that mean we don't meet together? No, we should come together. Why? Love. Because God loves us, right? And if he gets away, he shows he still loves us. That's right. That's right, he does. And as a family, the best way for a family to grow and find healing is if we gather together, right? God intended it. But it also, when we come together as a family, not only does we know that God loves us, but it shows that we love God, right? So every Sunday when we come to church as a family, we come to show and express our love for him. Right? And that's what families do. And it's kind of a, you know, it's a unique thing to think. You already have your, your personal family, but then you have your big extended church family. Do you also know that every church that meets to preach the gospel is part of that same family? That's a big family, isn't it? Do you know everybody in that family? Do you know everybody in that family? I love them. You love them, all right. I like them. Well, we're supposed to love them. That's what God tells us to do. And that's what we're going to talk about today. God told us we're supposed to act like a family. And that's a lot of times what it doesn't happen. We need to learn how to do that better, right? It's like in our own homes, our own families, we got to learn how to act and love each other. All right, so let's pray about that, okay? And then you can go to them. Dear God, we thank you for our family. We thank you for our individual families. Lord, we thank you for the family of God. The family that we get together together to find courage and strength, support in this world, going through these crazy times together. 
I thank you for Riley and his faith and his answers, Lord, how refreshing it is. And awesome to know, Lord, that you gather here and know you love us, and you share us, and you want us to love. So, Father, we want to submit our lives to you and follow the things you set up for us as a meek and honor. So, Lord, we thank you most of all for your faith that you made us a part of. And we just going to be with you forever and ever. Amen. All right. See you, buddy. Look at that, he just preached my whole message, so I guess we can go home early, right? All right, as we turn our attention to our time of prayer, I have several prayer requests that have already been sent to me, uh, asked this morning through message, whatever, so just want to present those to you. Uh, first of which, um, Michael has asked prayer for his sister's father-in-law in Michigan because he's in the ICU with with pneumonia, the flu, and COVID. So, uh, and his health wasn't very good, so he is in he is there in Michigan, so we need to be praying for him. Also, a uh, family that I ministered with in Hollis through the homeschool group there, one of the youth pastor, the Hayes, Derek Hayes, the husband, has been admitted to the hospital with COVID uh, ICU. He's probably my age. So be praying for him. Uh, Terry Dorsett, he's the executive, oh, All right, so, so the wife had symptoms of COVID, so the kids are transplanted to other homes to be safe. So be praying for the Hayes family. Terry Dorsett, who's the executive director for the Baptist Convention of New England, his wife, he and his wife both had COVID about three weeks ago, but she's been struggling, went back to the doctor and she has COVID lungs, is what they call it, it's an after effect. And so we're just asking prayer for her. Uh, Ruth Moore, uh, who is not here this morning, is in uh, AFib, and she's asked us to be praying for her AFib. It's been really bad the last couple of weeks. Um, Chuck has asked prayer for his older sister, who he's going to see this afternoon for her health and, and general care. Uh, JB reached out to me uh, from Texas and asked us to pray because she's having gastroesophageal surgery for a hernia tomorrow morning at 7, as well as she has back lumbar syndrome, and she's having like nine... Uh, Nine, I think it's level nine pain in it and asking for relief in that, as well as continued prayer for Geneva and the family. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Edie. Yeah. All right, so pray for uh, Edie's granddaughter, Cadence, who had wrist surgery and is in double cast. I also want to praise God for Liberty's recovery, and she's back with us this morning. So glad she's doing well, and it's good to see her out and about. And I'm glad she's probably glad that she's not in pain anymore. So <laughs> uh, go ahead, Frida. Okay. All right. So Frida's asked, Moore. what? What? Kathy Moore. Kathy Moore. Okay. So Frida's asked for prayer for an unspoken as well as for her sister in law, Kathy Moore. Okay. <laughs> that is a good praise. <laughs> hmm. Oh, we'll pray continued wisdom for them. They can discover it. So, Jimmy? Who now? Elaine. Okay. Bypass surgery? Okay. Marge? All right, for Marge's son, Chris, and the changes that are going through. Carol? Yes, I did hear that. Yes, Brett is having his knee surgery on Tuesday. All right, Eric. 
for Eric's mother, Cindy. All right. All right, well, let's go join our hearts together and lift these before the throne of grace. To you. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, this morning, as we gather here, we come with heavy hearts for those around us that are struggling, with those that are near to us that are suffering still in the midst of this pandemic. And Lord, we are asking for you to come and to, to bring healing, comfort, strength, Lord, to help families in need through so many different uh, aspects. And Lord, we're thankful for some of the progress that's being made in this time. But Lord, there's still people impacted and people that are suffering and, and Lord, people that are uh, sick and ill so, uh, still in this battling the COVID. And we ask, Father, that you would be glorified and magnified. We ask that you would pr provide the healing that is necessary to these these families, these moms and dads, grandparents, uh, in-laws, family members, Lord, friends, neighbors that we know that are still struggling with the uh, being in it and having COVID, but also, Lord, with the after effects. And so, Father, we ask right now that you would do what only you can, and we trust in you, Lord. We know that you are the sovereign God. We know that you are in control of all things, and you are above all things. And so we look to you in this time, and we ask, Father, you would help our faith. You would strengthen us as we walk and trust in you as we don't see the whole big picture of what's going on, but you do. And so, Father, we lean upon that and we ask, Lord, that you would help us together to trust in, in, in these times to follow you and to be close to you or to understand that you are doing some mighty things as well in the midst of all of this. And so, Father, I ask that you would work in the only way that you, you can and that's beyond what we can even see or fathom. And Lord, sometimes we don't know how to pray because we seem to pray the same thing over and over. And Lord, our faith, some days is weak, some days it's strong. And we look to you, Father, for help in that. Increase our faith. Help us to walk and be strong. To know that you are with us and you are guiding us. That your spirit is filling us. And in these times where we don't know what's going on, you would help us to know that you do, and we can rest assured of that, even if we can't see it. I know it's hard on our young people as they struggle through uh, these days and these times, and Lord, there will be a time of recovery that we will get through this valley. But as we go through this, Lord, we ask that you would provide what we need and help us, Lord, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically, each day as we go through this, that we go through it together and not alone, that we rest in you through your word and we find strength as we cast our cares upon you. And so, Lord, we cast the cares of our loved ones at your feet and we pray for Michael's sister's father-in-law there in Michigan as he's battling COVID and pneumonia and the flu and the ICU. We pray, Father, that you would protect and bring healing, restore his body and his strength. We pray for Derek and Rebecca Hayes as they both have COVID and, and Derek's been taken to the hospital. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring restoration and healing in, in his life as well. We pray for Terry uh, Dorsett's wife, Lord, as she's battling the after effects of COVID with this COVID lungs and breathing issues. And we ask, Father, that you would give them the strength as they go through this day by day in battling this, this physical ailment, knowing, Lord, it is only temporary in this life. Pray for Ruth as she battles her AFib and it, and it keeps her down. We pray that you would bring recovery and get her heart back in rhythm, strengthen it. We pray for Chuck's older sister and Lord, as he travels out there today to care for her and with his other sister, that you would give them protection on the highway. And as they come and minister to their sister and helping uh, get things ready for the spring and summer and Lord, that you would just be a blessing in that, in that opportunity. We pray for JB and Neil and we're so thankful that we are connected each week with them as they join us online from Texas. And we lift her up as she prepares for this gastroesophageal surgery tomorrow morning at seven. We pray, Father, that you would just guide the doctor's hands, calm their spirits. We pray for her back uh, problem, Lord, the pain that she's in. We pray for comfort and relief. We pray for Geneva this morning. It's been so long since we've seen her here, Lord, and I know that she's battling the, her, her body and her age and her limits. 
We pray, Father, that you would just be with her and let her know her family is loving, uh, loves her and misses her and is praying for her and lifting her up. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, be with the entire family in these days. We pray for uh, Edie's granddaughter, Cadence, Lord, that as she's had this wrist surgery, that you would just help her to recover. We pray for Frida's unspoken, Lord. You know what the, the, the need is. You know what the, the situation. We pray for your wisdom, your direction, your spirit to move in a mighty way there. We pray for her sister-in-law, Lord, Kathy Moore, and her health. And, and Lord, we lift her up and we place her in your arms and say, Lord, you're the great physician. We pray for um, Elay, Lord, in this bypass that she faces. We pray for uh, just a, a easy surgery. We pray for Marge's son, Marge and Jeff's son, Chris, and the changes going through his life. Lord, that you would be his guide, that as he turns to you, that you would show him the way and give him peace that passes all understanding as he trusts in your leading for job and his marriage and for housing. We pray for Brett as he prepares for this knee surgery. Lord, he's been in pain for so long that this would be a relief and it would fix the problem that he has so we can continue to carry on with the, the, the job and the ministry he has to so many people. We pray for Eric's mother, Cindy, Lord. Uh, we pray for Red Moore this morning. We pray for your church, that we would be a church, Lord, that conducts as you have called us to, to love each other, to care for one another, to lift each other up, to serve one another, to cast our cares together before you, to be hospitable to one another to spur each other on to good deeds, to love. Father, that as a family, we would grow and we would minister. And, and Lord, we, as we serve you, that we would in turn serve those around us, that they too can come in to be called children, the children of God. They can come and find salvation through, through faith in Christ. We pray, Lord, for your church, Lord, not only here, but Lord, in this state, around the world that gathers on Sunday mornings as they gather to worship you. May you be glorified. May you be magnified and honored. May you speak through your instruments, the, the preachers in each one of these churches, the truths that need to be here to convict and challenge and change the hearts and lives of people. For only true change comes from your word, for it is the truth that we need. And so, Father, I pray that you would do that this morning here in this place, that your Holy Spirit would come that your spirit would just fill me with the words that you've laid on my heart and that we would all be receptive to the truth that we so desperately need. We ask, Father, that the gospel would go forth clear, that people would hear what they need to hear to help them to serve you, to follow you, to come to you. So, Lord, we ask right now your blessing upon this next, time, this next little bit of time as we look into your word. May we be attentive to hear your voice speak to us and challenge us. For to your name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, we'll be there in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We've come to the kind of the, the, the center point of his letter to the, to the church. All right. And it really is just in these three verses, we're going to talk about the church's conduct and confession. And the reality is a lot of our confession, all right, is spoken through our conduct. And our conduct reflects our confession. Now, in Jesus' day, in Matthew chapter 25, excuse me, 20, uh, 23, Jesus is, is walking through, preparing for the cross. And one day he starts teaching about the, the, the Pharisees. And he says that Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So even the lead spiritual leaders of that day, Jesus confronted them and said, you got to do what they tell you to do because they're, they're telling you from God's word. But don't be like them because they're hypocrites. And, and the funny thing is, is, we live in a day, an age, where there are a lot of hypocrites around that say one thing and their lives reflect a different thing. There are a lot of churches that act hypocritical, that say and love one way, but act totally different. And Paul 
to, look to Timothy, to the church at Ephesus, he's telling him, I want you to teach the people how they are to conduct themselves in a way that honors who God is, what God has established, and what God has brought us to do as guardians of that truth. This is our responsibility to one another, just like we have a responsibility in our own homes. And he's, he's, he's telling Timothy that the message of the gospel, the central theme of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, is what everything is built around. Our conduct should reflect the change that comes from knowing Christ as Savior, knowing Christ as Lord, and knowing Christ as the one that we follow and serve and, and follow his example. So he lays out this, this, these truths, and he comes to this critical point. The problem is, in most churches, the message of the gospel gets washed out, gets lost in programs and ministry because we become too busy doing things. I mean, here Paul's telling Ephesus, this is it, the gospel, love one another, this is it. And you go to Revelation chapter 2, the first church that John writes to is the church of Ephesus. And he says, you do great and mighty things. You're busy people, but this one thing I have against you. You lost your first love. And what Paul was telling Timothy is, our first love should not be about what we're doing, but who we are serving and who we are following and how we do that. That our conduct reflects our confession. Because actions speak louder than words. He wants them to know how to conduct themselves in a specific way. And, you know, we, we call this the doctrine of ecclesiology in, the, in, in theology class in Bible school. And now you're thinking, what in the world? Ecclesiology? Ecclesia is the Greek word for church or the assembling together. All right. That's the, the Greek word. And we get ecclesiology out. And it's, we call it the doctrine of the church. The problem is, for most, many people in the church don't understand what the church is, how the church functions, because it's been lost. If we better understand the, the significance of church, the doctrine of the church, and what the, the, kind of this can be silly here because I'm a song person, the song of the church should be, the, the outpouring, the flow from the church, we will be better able and a better witness to the world around us. All right? You know, it's funny. You can always tell somebody a little bit by the music they listen to. You can tell a little bit about a person's character by the, the music they listen to. All right? If all you listen to is country, then I'm going to say you're going to have like a, don't take this the wrong way, a redneck feel about you. Okay? If you listen to the 50s music, well, you know, I will go there. Okay. All right. So, all right. If you, if you listen to rock and roll, all right, you know, uh, you know, you, there's, so, there's, there's a vibe that comes out of that. I mean, a person who's more conservative and rolled back usually doesn't listen to rock and roll. If they do, well, I, maybe I'm wrong, okay? But there, there's something about the song we sing, the, the outpouring of our life that reflects, all right, the significance of where we belong. And in the church especially, there should be a song that we sing spiritually together that reflects praise and glory to the God we love because he loves us. And that comes out of our understanding of what the church is, what the church does, how we serve one another, how we minister. But we've lost that view of the church within the church. We think the church is about its programs. We think the church is about its budget. All right? The church really isn't, doesn't really have a whole lot to do with this building or its programs. It has to do with the people that sit in the pews or who join us online. We are the church. Pastor Mark Devers, in his book, The Church, The Gospel Made Visible, writes about the neglect of this teaching. He says, for too many Christians today, the doctrine of the church is like a decoration on the front of a building. Maybe it's pretty, maybe it's not. But finally, it's unimportant because it bears no weight. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. The doctrine of the church is of the utmost importance. It is the most visible part of Christian theology, and it is vitally connected with every other part. If we understand that we are the church of God, and that we are the visible expression of the gospel, the transformation, the change of God's love in us, 
then that should reflect in how we love one another, how we love our communities, how we love our state, how we pray earnestly for them. I mean, we go back and we look at the first three chapters of Timothy. Paul is giving specific instructions about that conduct. We should be praying for one another. We should be lift men. We should be lifting holy hands, interceding on God's behalf, interceding for others around us that God would work and save. We should be about wanting to grow together as men and women serving together equally, ministering, raising up men who want to become pastors and men who want to lead in the church, who want to follow God's heart. And I believe Mark Dever's assessment is true within the church. We've, we, we don't talk about those doctrinal truths about what a church is. Because we have many people, young people today, including, you know, people that I know, young kids I know have asked this question, because to them the church appears irrelevant or optional because far too many Christians opt out of going to church on Sundays. They opt out of being involved in Bible studies. They opt out of the things of God for the things of this world. And so therefore, they see that church really isn't relevant. And kids today, young families today, they're looking for re relevance. They're looking for significance. They're looking for that which is important. And if they can't find it in the church, they're going to go somewhere else. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, relationships, pornography, Whatever it might be, they're looking for re a re a relevance and significance. And we as a church should be displaying that they are relevant. They are significant to God. Our acts together, our love together demonstrate that. And so Paul comes to this letter and he says, although I hope to come to you soon, he's saying, I want to come. I want to give you this instruction personally. But if I can't make it, Timothy, here it is. All right, if I'm delayed, you will know how. You will teach them how they ought to conduct themselves. And so he says two things in these two verses, verses 15 and 16. The first thing he's going to talk about is the church's significance. This is how the church is significant. Our conduct is significant. Why? Because we are part of God's family. Think of that for just a minute. He says, I, if I'm delayed, you will know how to conduct. You, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. That word is used, he's used it three times in this one chapter by itself. He talked about the pastor should be, you know, managing his household, the deacon. So this is talking about family here. We're talking about family unit, okay? Now, I'm not saying that all families get along because I know within families, families can have problems. You know, I tell my, I tell my kids, I said, there's nothing you could ever do that will ever stop you from, stop me from loving you, no matter how bad it is. I will always love them. They will always bear my name, except for my daughters. When they get married, they'll change their last name. But, you know, they're still my, my kids. Family is important. As much as we want to push them aside, as much as we don't like getting together with some of them, Family is that unit where we find love, where we find relevance, where we find encouragement together. But yet in today's, in today's age, Satan has won a victory in breaking the family unit apart. Keeping us too busy from being family. I mean, back in the day, you had whole family units that went all the way from mom and dad and kids to grandparents, great-grandparents, all living together, influencing one another. And yet... We find it hard to spend time with our, with our parents once we get older. Or, and part of that, uh, you know, we, in a society we live, we move across, but this means we, we can't call or video chat with one another. But family is important. See, in my household, we have me, my wife, my two sons, and my daughter, a cat, a hamster, a fish, and now a brand new bunny. Seems to be growing with more animals than kids these days. And the problem is I think the kids are going to leave and the bunny and the animals are going to stay. So I'm going to end up having to take care of them. But that's my household. And my, my household, theoretically, or I'll use this right here, theoretically operates on my rules. Now, my kids will probably all laugh at that because it operates on mommy's rules. But, you know, theoretically, it's my house. I'm the leader of the house. All right. It operates according to my rules. Children go to bed at a certain time. Most nights. They act a certain way at the dinner table. Most, most times. 
when we're actually home enough to eat nowadays that we're busy, they, uh, they treat their mother a certain way, always. I make sure of that. They always treat their mother with respect. They respond to me in a certain way. Yep, they do. Yep, they certainly do. And on and on. I mean, we, we have a household. I have rules. This is the way it's supposed to be. And we can move and we can tweak a little here and there as they get older. It's not like you treat your kids when they were two. Now they're, you know, 15 and a half and getting behind the wheel of a car the same way. All right. You, you tweak those rules. But, you know, as, as the head of the house, as my household and my family, my job is to create boundaries, not to keep them, keep them from going out, but to try and protect them, to help them to grow and think through and process and make decisions. Within the church, we, too, are a family. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. By, by God's word, we've been brought together. We are part of his family, which means it's his rules. It's his order. It's his directive. Not mine, not the deacons, not the trustees, not you. It's him. It's all about him. And as a family to, to, to best serve and thrive, if you follow God's rules, and do things the way God has put forth, you have his blessing. And you experience his love in a huge way. He provides healing, forgiveness, mercy, and grace. But when we don't act like that family, when we don't follow those rules, it creates chaos and disorder. A.W. Tozer gave this truth unforgettable expression when he wrote, has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord be, by being tuned, not to each other, but to another standard to which each one must individually bow. So 100 worshipers meet together, each one looking away to Christ, are in heart nearer to each other than they could possibly be were they, were they to become un unity conscience and turn their eyes away from God to strive for closer fellowship. What he's saying is that there's a hundred pianos and in order them to sound in unison, they don't tune to one another. They turn tune to an outsourced tuner and they're all playing the same pitch as that outsourced, outsourced tuner is that fork and they're in unison. And as a church, we come together not to express our individualism, but to express what Christ has done us. And if we're looking to Christ, if we are gathered here looking to Christ, we are more in tune than if I take my eyes off Christ and look, okay, how can I, I gotta be like Campbell over here, or I gotta be like Joe over here, and I gotta be like Brett over here. We're, we're trying to be like each individual person who has our flaws. And the one person that we should be focused on is who? Christ, because he's perfect. We are a family. So the church is a family. Where God is Father, and we are his children, John states in John 1, 12, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The right to become children of God. There's a song that pops in my head every time I was studying this week, and I, I'm just going to say the words here. And if you start singing it, go for it. I don't care. In your head, just do it in your head. Don't do it out loud. But there's a song that was written. And it says, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've washed in the fountain, cleansed by the blood. Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. No matter how, how many people are out there, every one of them is looking for a place of relevance, a place of significance, a place to belong. Even in their own families, they struggle to find that. Why? Because sin has corrupted the hearts and lives of people. And only coming to know the grace and forgiveness of Christ can we be unified back into what God originally intended the family to be. And so he says, I want you to learn how to conduct yourselves as the family of God. Which is why in our church covenant, which I have sitting right here today, our church covenant, we list out all those things we're supposed to do. We commit ourselves to God and to one another to be Christ-like in our lives and relationships through the presence, guidance, and power of the Holy Spirit. We will love one another, honor one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, encourage and build up one another, comfort one another, offer hospitality to one another. That's what family does. We will forgive each other when there's wrong. We will offer grace. Why? Because God has shown grace and mercy to us. 
When people look at our church, when people see us, do they see us as a family that loved each other? Or as a family that's divided by our own opinions, by our own views, by our own ways and, and desires? Far too many people see the church as divided than united. They see hypocrites over those who are seeking to follow Christ who confess one thing yet, but when they go out in life, their lives dictate another. Which is why I'm telling you, conduct is supposed to be a reflection of our confession, but far too often we confess Christ and our conduct goes out the window. We're a family. Not only did he describe the church as a family, look what he says here next. He says, people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. You and I are God's dwelling place. You and I are God's dwelling place. When we gather here, the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in, in their midst. God dwells with us. When we gather on Sunday morning, the presence of God should be felt in our hearts and lives, and we should receive it with joy and enthusiasm and excitement to come into the presence of God and say, thank you, Jesus, because you are with me. The language that is used here should cause someone to look back to how God has dwelt with his people, going all the way back to Jacob and at Bethel, where Jacob met God and had that dream, and he saw the ladder in heaven. It was coming up and down, and he actually named that place Bethel because it means house of God. It was a place where he met with God, and his presence came and filled him. Then you have Moses, and Moses was given the instructions to build the tabernacle. When they finished the tabernacle, what happened in Exodus 25:8? God came down in a big cloud and he filled the Holy of Holies that the presence of God was in the middle of the tribes of Israel. The same thing happened when Solomon built the temple in 1 Kings 6, 13. In the New Testament, though, there was no special city. There was no tabernacle. There was no temple where God dwells. Rather, Paul says this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 18, or verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. God doesn't live on this platform. He doesn't live in heaven. He comes and he lives in you. His Holy Spirit comes and, and walks with you. The holy, awesome, all-powerful, most significant God in all the universe comes to dwell with you. And we should rejoice in the fact that that God loves us that much that he wants to be with us. God's spirit fills us and resides in us and manifests himself through us. Not for our glory, but for each other, for the good of one another. I mean, Paul, once again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 It says in verse 7, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The spiritual gifts that we have, hospitality, leadership, all of the different the, the, the spiritual gifts, the Spirit manifests itself through the body of Christ for the good of one another. So my gift of teaching and preaching or prophecy isn't for my good. It's for your good. And if you have the gift of hospitality, it's not for your good, but it's for the body's good. Why? Because we're together, the body of Christ, seeking to glorify Christ, who is the head of the church. I'm not the head of the church. I'm just the under-shepherd. Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of this family. And so, therefore, we got to remember that we are the temple of God. When I was a youth pastor, I used to tell the kids in that verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, you need to honor God with your body. Just short-term it, all right? God dwells in you. And when you know someone great and mighty is coming to your house, what do you usually do at your house? I mean, if the president was going to come into your house, what would you do? Even though you may not agree with him or anything, but if the president was coming to your house, what would you do? I know what my wife would do. She'd kick all of us out, and she would spot clean everything because we'd all make it a mess. All right? I mean, she would just, which is pretty much what she did yesterday. All right? She kicked us out. Well, actually, the kids had to go work. But, you know, we would clean the house top to bottom, make sure there's no dust or anything. I mean, we want to make it look good, right? Because the president is coming to our house. Or a foreign minister, whatever. Think of this. God, who is greater than all of them, comes to your house every day. 
And he comes to your heart every day. Do you surrender to clean your life to him? Do you, do you ask him to forgive you, to help you so that you can honor him with what you say, with what you hear, with what you do, so that you could be an influence on this younger generation that needs people to show them that they're relevant? You mean influence to them, to the truth of who God is. That God wants to live in each one of them, just like he lives in us. So that we can be the embodiment of his love. Not only do he, he doesn't stop there though. He goes right on and he says, not only are you the church of the living God, he says, you are the pillar and foundation of the truth, which is where we get our title for this series, the guardians of the, of the truth. We are the guardians of the gospel. We are the guardians of that truth. Paul describes us as the pillar and foundation of that truth. In the King James, it uses the word bulwark. All right. It's a fortress that's built up. All right. To protect. So this image actually demonstrates two things, which are our responsibility as the people of God, as the family, as God's children. We are to preserve God's word, which means we're to hold it firm. And we are to proclaim God's word to hold it high. Now, pillars and foundation, hold firm. The foundation is to hold firm to that truth, which is, which as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 8, 58, therefore be immovable. Always abounding in the world and knowing that you labor not in vain. Why? Because God's word will always bear fruit. Because he says God's word will not return void. It will always bear forth fruit in us and in the lives of others. So we need to hold firm to what? The gospel. Paul is saying this is, this is what you got to hold to, that God came and died for sinners of whom I'm the worst. We got to hold, for, hold firm to the fact that Christ is supreme. And we'll get to that in the next verse. We need to hold, not only do we need to hold it firm, but we need to hold it high and exalt it. You know, many times in sports season, we, we, we hold high our, our sports heroes. As, as uh, my, my good friend Bud would say, Tom Brody or Tom Brady. We hold him on high. Why? Because he's done great things for the New England area and bringing lots of championships to us, right? I mean, we're, we're proud of that. Did he die for your sins? Yeah, far too many Christians will hold Tom Brady over Christ in their life and exalt Tom Brady over that of Christ. I'll never forget the time that I watched sports so much so that it was neglecting my kids and I got to remember now that that's not important. I had to give that up. Why? Because it's far better for my kids to spend time with my kids than it is to watch and, and uh, somebody in a game I can't even... Even no matter how I'm excited or I want to change the outcome of the game, I can't get excited about that. But we should hold Christ high in our lives every day of the week because we are his children and we are guardians of that truth that Jesus came. The picture here is of a pillar. And right there in Ephesus is one of the seven wonders of the world in the temple of Diana. And in this massive temple, there are 100 pillars holding up this massive marble ceiling. And it's a wonder they, they were able to get this whole marble ceiling to stay up there by this 100 pillars. And it's a picture, Paul's using that picture for us, that we are supposed to be one of the pillars holding up the truth that God loves the world. And we're supposed to testify to that great truth, which by the side note, I would like you all to go to YouTube and check on a, a cool new podcast called Testify, done by our very own Michael Kirk right over here. And it's awesome. What an encouragement it is to, to hear him share his testimony and encourage us to testify to who Christ is. So if you have extra time, go for that. He doesn't know I was plugging that in there, but it was just so I wanted to share that. To so think about what we need to be doing. We need to be just that. We need to be testifying to the gospel by what we say, how we do, how we act. We need to hold firm from age to age, from generation to generation. We need to, We have the responsibility of passing down the word of God by reflecting how we hold fast to it, how we defend it, all right, from the false teaching that would threaten it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 16. If I can get there. I'll never forget this verse here stuck out to me only after I went to Word of Life. I'm going to go back to verse 14. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure 
children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Oh, does that sound like what we're living in today? How do you do that? Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. When I got to Word of Life, we sang this song, Holding Forth the Word of Life. Now, don't, don't ask me now because I don't remember all the words, but I'm sure my wife could tell you all the words if she remembers it. Probably doesn't matter to me, but holding forth the Word of Life. I mean, do we hold this high? Do our kids, do our neighbors, do people want to see us in it? Not, I'm not talking about putting it on, a, on, a, on the bookcase or on display, but do we hold its truths high? That's what he's saying here. We're guardians of that truth. The main work of the church should be to bear witness to the person and work of Jesus Christ, not to the person and work of Ari Keller, not to the person and work of the deacons. Everything we do as a church should reflect the work that Jesus did in saving us and transforming us so that others can come to that truth. Because I can't save anybody. Which is why Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. First for the Jew and then the Greek. Salvation is a work of God that transforms people, brings hope and, and help and peace. I have heard it said, let us magnify it, amplify it, spotlight it, and spread it. The word of God in the church and all over the world. The gospel. And therefore, he ends with this great song. If we are fulfilling the significant role that God has for us, the significant role of being a child of God, the significant role of being the temple of God, and being a pillar and foundation to the truth of God, this will be the church's song. Beyond all question, the mystery for which true godliness springs is great. And this was a hymn back in the day. I'm not going to sing it because I don't even know the, what they, how they sang it, but this was a hymn that the early church sang. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the Word, was taken up in glory. The church's song is the mystery of godliness. And what's that mystery? Mystery isn't something that's being held secret. It's something that hasn't been revealed. And we know the mystery of godliness was that Christ was revealed to bring salvation and hope to the world. To bring restoration, regeneration, reconciliation. The idea is that our lives become God-centered so that whether we, awake, whether we are awake or asleep, whether we're thinking, dreaming, desiring, talking, eating, drinking, it is all centered on Christ. So I apologize. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do all unto the what? Glory of God. The church's song, the church's praise, its prayer, its declaration needs to be centered on Christ alone. For he is the one who bought us. He is the one who saves us. He is the, the one who brings us into fellowship with the Almighty. And he is the one who can only do beyond that which we can even fathom. As Paul writes, even immeasurably more than we can even think. It is he who fills us with hope. It is he who brings peace in our hearts. It is he who gives us significance and purpose in life. Paul's desire to see the believers in Ephesus act the right way as the household of God was not simply a call to do good deeds, to good behavior. It was a call to act in accordance with the truth of who Christ is, and what he's accomplished through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Why does Christ deserve this? Why does he deserve this high praise? Well, look at what it says. He appeared in the flesh. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He deserves praise because he left glory to come and be like us. It says here he was vindicated by the Spirit. Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus got baptized, what is the picture? It says that when he was baptized, the heavens opened and a dove descended upon him. And God said, behold, my son. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul writes, 
he pictures it this way. Romans 1, 4. And who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The spirit rose him, raised him from the dead in chapter 8 and verse 11 in Romans. He goes on again and he says, And if the, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. We have life through Christ. Christ is the son of God because the spirit of God came down and he proved it by raising him from the dead and now residing in us. But he goes on, he goes a little bit on. He says, not only was he vindicated by the spirit, but was seen by the angels. Think about in the life of Christ, who announced his coming to Mary, an angel. Who announced his resurrection to Mary when, he, when she went to the tomb? An angel. And when Jesus was taken up into heaven in Acts chapter 1 and in the end of the Gospels, who announced that he has gone unto glory? An angel. He was seen by the angels. And because of who he was, what he did, how he was vindicated, and the angel's announcement, it says here, was preached among the nations. When the gospel spread in the early church in Acts 1.8, the, Holy, the angels, Jesus said to the, the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost. To the uttermost. He was preached among the nations. And we know from the book of Acts that it started in Jerusalem, persecution came, and it was spread and filled the whole earth. So much so that today, the gospel is preached in Africa and Asia and Australia, New Zealand, every country around the world. There's even a little island off the coast of India that is a very um, primal tribe still. They don't have any electricity, no running water. They're, they, they're an unreached people. And people have gone and tried to take the gospel to them. Several missionaries have lost their life landing on the beaches because they are cannibals. But they still take and they, they'll drop, fly over, drop Bibles and food and stuff to this tribe of people on this island in Indonesia. Why? Because they still need to hear the truth of God's love for them. Then he goes on and he says, was believed on in the world. Jesus was believed on. Why? Because he was preached. We know that in Romans chapter 10, Paul writes this great, this great passage. And he says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How will anybody know about the work of Christ if we do not go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world? We hold forth to the truth and we hold it high by proclaiming it to the world around us so that they too can believe on him in whom he have found life and hope and healing. And the last thing here it says, and he was taken up in glory. There's no other religion out there that has a God who came and died for mankind and now has is arisen and beaten death and sits back in glory than Jesus Christ. He is the King of glory. He is the Lord of lords and, and he is an awesome God. He is the awesome God. Paul was not only preaching who Jesus is, but he was also saying to the church, realize what this means to you as the people of God. As, the child, as a child of God. For godliness in your life re is reflected upon your relationship with Christ. For godliness in the church is a reflection of our relationship to Christ. There's a powerful application here that I want to just, as I get ready to close this morning, share with you. Think about this. If, if this is true, that God loves us and he's made us children and he lives in us. Are you here? This morning, going through a hard time, are you online with us going through a hard time? Christ lives within you. Are you struggling in your weakness? Are you struggling with sin? Are you struggling with, with, with doubt or uh, a low faith? Christ is strength in you. Are you bruised and battered, beaten up by all kinds of other people out there, by words and things? Listen to this, Christ is healing in you. 
Are you confused and not sure what to do? You don't know which direction to go. You have, you have anxiety and, and it struggles. Well, guess what? With Christ, Christ is peace in you. Not just any peace, but peace that passes all understanding. Are you wondering if you can overcome the things that you're dealing with right now? Can we overcome the pandemic? Can we overcome my emotional, uh, my mental capacities? Can I overcome uh, SID or habit habits that are drawing me away and wrecking my life? Well, Christ in you is greater than the one who is in this world. He is life. He is strength. He is hope. He is Christ in you, the hope of glory, according to Colossians 1.27. And together today, we stand in awe of him. We sing praise to him because of who he is and what he does. Paul even wrote in his letter to, Ephes to, to, to this very church that he's talking to Timothy about how to conduct themselves. And I'm going to close with this passage of scripture. Because it is powerful and mighty. And the word of God is what goes out and what we need. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 20, just listen to what Paul says to the church of Ephesus, what God says to us today. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And here it is. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from, the, from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see how that passage correlates to each one of us? We were once dark. God brought us into the light. He made us children of light. And now as we grow together, we need to wake up. Get, stop sleeping and slumbering and stop being lazy in this world. We have a job to do as God's children, as his family, as his temple, as guardians of the truth, because the world around us is trying to destroy that truth right in front of our very eyes, in front of our kids' eyes. And if we don't stand up for it, we're going to miss out. And we need to make the most of every opportunity. Why? Because the days are evil. Therefore, we need to be filled with the Spirit, and, there, and in that filling, we need to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. It means our heart needs to be that of what he just said in 1 Timothy 3. Our words, our life need to be reflective to our belief in who Christ is. What Christ has done, and we need to preach him. Our song of our, our church, the song of our heart, should be that we stand in awe of who he is. And we are going to let the world know how much he loves them by the way that we love one another. Jesus said, you'll know, they'll know you love me by what? Your love for one another. Church, we can, conf we can confess Christ all we want, but if our conduct does not reflect our confession, then it is faulty. Paul says, I want you to know how you had to conduct yourselves. And your conduct should reflect your confession of who Jesus is. How he came from glory, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by the angels, was believed on in the world, was preached, and now has returned to glory. And one day, church, he's coming back for us. And until he does, we have a responsibility to this world to be the children of light. How are you doing? How's your conduct, church? How's your confession? Do people see him in you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning and the privilege we have to come and to open your word. To understand we are relevant. This world needs us to follow you. This world needs us to show you. This world needs us to, to, to see the, the transformation that takes place when the gospel takes root in our heart and we stop living for ourselves, our opinions, our desires. And we pick up the word of God and we live for the truth of Jesus Christ. 
that that which saved us becomes our marching orders. That which saved, saved us becomes our life source. That our conduct is transformed because of our confession in Christ. That we love greater. That we forgive more. That we are gracious to one another. That we don't complain or grumble because we are seeking to honor you. That we are in tune with you in all we do. How awesome it is, Lord, you've called us in that type of relationship. You, the great and awesome God, have called us to be your children. How grateful I am, how grateful we are for that privilege, Lord. And as we close today, we want to praise you, for you alone are worthy. For your name we pray. Amen. pray right now for your church, for your people, not only here at Small Point, but all over the world, Lord, that gather to worship you, that our conduct reflects the mystery of godliness, that we stand and we live in awe of who you are and what you do. Help us, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.